went to the gentle men and women from the press want to talk about. You want this recorded? Yeah. Okay. Should I go ahead and ask you a question? Sure, anything. Okay. Um, we're led to think that anarchism is bomb-throwing mayhem. What is, what is it that attracts you to anarchism? Uh, anarchism has nothing to do with bomb throwing mayhem. It's uh, anarchism is a, a point of view which, uh, first of all, it covers a lot of things. You know, political rhetoric is not the clearest. Uh, it's not a model of clarity, and anarchism has covered quite a lot of ground. But the mainstream of it uh, has just been the basic principle, which I think comes straight out of classical liberalism and the Enlightenment, that. Uh, uh, any form of authority and domination uh, has, a, has a burden of proof to bear. It has to demonstrate that it's legitimate, no matter what it is, whether it's inside a family or uh, you know, in the global economy. <coughs> if, <it's coughs> if it is a form of authority and domination and coercion, <coughs> it has to show that it's legitimate. If it can demonstrate it's legitimate, and it's a heavy burden to bear. If it shows that it's legitimate, okay. If not, it ought to be dismantled. That's anarchism. That's the, it's the task of those who have the authority to demonstrate that. So for example, if I'm taking a walk with my granddaughter and she, oops, okay, and she, uh, suppose I'm taking a walk with my granddaughter and she runs, across, runs out into the street, okay, and I grab her and pull her back. Well, that's authority uh, and it's my task to demonstrate that it's legitimate and I think in this case if anybody challenged me, I could make an argument saying that's legitimate authority. Uh, but the burden of proof is always on those who exercise it. Uh, that's true if it's uh, men and women, parents and children, uh, owners and people they rent, uh, the state and people who serve it, uh, the IMF and people who follow its orders, uh, wherever it is. So there's no general definition of what legitimate authority is. It's the task of those who exercise authority to demonstrate their legitimacy. They're the ones who have the burden of proof. And if they can't meet that burden by explaining why what they do is legitimate, then they have no right to exercise the authority. And whatever institution, any institution within which they exercise, it is illegitimate unless they show otherwise. Uh, and the anarchists are just people who believe that and try to do something about it. Well, I don't, I don't mean that every minute of the day everybody has to be saying, look, this is my legitimate authority, but they have to be prepared to meet the challenge. Sure, and so, so if it's like a, demo, suppose it's a formally democratic state. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, in principle, that challenge is met by <coughs> interchange among the population, mm -hmm. which recognizes the authority of the, of actions in the public arena mm -hmm. through constant interaction, debate, struggle and so on. In theory, that's what happens if it is a democratic state. Uh, to the extent that that doesn't happen, it's not a democratic state and it is illegitimate. Uh, when you move to other systems of authority, like say private corporations or fascist states or uh, other forms of totalitarianism, uh, there's no question of legitimacy because they have none. Yeah. So, but it's the responsibility of the other people in that, in that institution, whatever that institution might be, to question no, it's not their responsibility. It's their responsibility to meet the challenge. It's the responsibility of people to make the challenge. So it's the responsibility of, uh, say, women to challenge uh, a framework in which they are supposed to wash the dishes and put the children to sleep and that sort of thing. Uh, and it's the responsibility of men in a patri traditional patriarchic family to an answer that challenge. Uh, I mean, it would be nice if you could if the challenge could be raised by those in positions of authority, but that's pretty rare. I mean, usually when you're in a position of authority, you kind of internalize the values that say it's right and just. And the reason is because, I think, because most people are sort of decent human beings, and it's very hard to tell your, to look in the mirror and say, I'm a bastard. Uh, so usually what you do is look in the mirror and say, I'm a nice guy, uh, and I do these things because it's right and just and legitimate. <coughs> 
Uh, and that's pretty standard, you know. I mean, everybody knows that from their own experience. We don't have to go into it. That's what people are like. Uh, and therefore, the responsibility of uh, raising the challenge is typically in the hands of those who recognize that they have a subordinate status. It's very hard to recognize that. I mean, people live, you know, for millennia, you know, without recognizing that they are being subordinated in systems of power. I mean, that's true of uh, women, for example. It's, it's in our slaves, you know. I mean, most slave societies were accepted by the slaves as legitimate and, in fact, necessary. Uh, and and uh, uh, a large part, and, and the same is true of, uh, for example, people have jobs today in our society. Uh, almost without exception, they consider it legitimate for them to be in a position where they have to rent themselves in order to survive. That's not, certainly not obvious, you know. Uh, and in fact, if you go back a century ago, uh, it was not only considered not obvious, it was considered outlandish by, or, by a work, American working people. And I'm not talking about Marxists or socialists or anybody like that, but say uh, mill hands in <coughs> Lowell, Massachusetts, who never heard of socialism, uh, who regarded it as a form of slavery and were complaining that uh, they uh, had not fought the Civil War to <coughs> replace chattel slavery by wage slavery. Uh, and that therefore those who work in the mills ought to own them uh, because that's the Republican rights that we won in the American Revolution and so on and so forth. So, you know, it's not obvious. But by now, I think enough indoctrination and propaganda and so on has taken place so people do regard that form of subordination to external authority as legitimate. Whether they should is another question, but the fact is they do just as for most of history, women have accepted a subordinate role as correct and proper and so on, uh, and slaves did, and people living in, say, uh, feudal societies. In a feudal society, people had a place, you know, uh, some kind of role, and quite typically the societies were stable because people regarded those structures as legitimate. Uh, the same is true of religious structures and uh, uh, I mean, throughout human life, there's a whole variety of systems of authority and oppression and domination and so on, which are usually accepted as legitimate by the people subordinated to them. When they don't, you have struggles and revolutions and sometimes changes and sometimes brutality and so on. Uh, that's, uh, I, as far as I understand it, anarchists are just people who take this seriously. Well, the Spanish Revolution in 1936 was <coughs> an unusual event in that uh, a fairly large scale uh, anarchist revolution did take place in a pretty, uh, in a modern society, fairly modern society. I mean, sort of halfway between the industrial world and the third world. So sectors of it were highly industrialized, like Catalonia. Others were peasant societies, like, you know, Aragon countryside. Uh, and it was very large scale, and it had a very a lot of complexity and all sorts of complicated things go on in popular movements, but it was quite substantial in scale. And it had strong libertarian elements. Uh, and it uh, was interesting to see that the entire world was mobilized against it instantly. Uh, the communists, the fascists, and the liberal democracies instantly combined to crush that revolution that they were not going to allow. And in fact, they went after it right away and smashed it. Uh, and then they got to the secondary question of fighting what we call the civil war in Spain, uh, the f war between the fascists and the republicans. That's the one that in history is called the war. Uh, but there was another war, namely this one. And incidentally, that's not so unusual. Uh, if you take a look at uh, what you study in history as civil wars with two sides, they usually have three sides. Uh, at least, sometimes more. Uh, there's usually the two sides that are, you know, get into the history books, uh, and then there's a big mass of the population who hates both of them, you know, usually the majority, in fact. So if you take the American Revolution, uh, which was pretty much a civil war, in fact, the proportion of people fighting on the two sides, local people, I don't mean foreigners, it was not so different from the civil, what we call a civil war. It was a civil war, 
uh, between what are here called loyalists and revolutionaries. Uh, but a good bit of the population didn't want anything to do with either of them. Uh, and in fact, uh, after the revolution, it was necessary to suppress uh, radical farmers who were taking seriously the uh, rhetoric in the revolutionary pamphlets. And they had to be taught that that stuff is not to be taken seriously. Uh, we're not going to have a social change, and there isn't going to be that kind of freedom and liberty that you guys thought you were fighting for. Uh, and they had to be repressed. Uh, and it wasn't so mild either. Uh, so, for example, I mean, th there wasn't mass murder, you know, like it wasn't Pol Pot. Uh, on the other hand, part of the reason why there wasn't mass murder after the American Revolution is that a huge part of the population just fled in terror. Uh, it's not something you usually study in history books, but uh, the proportion of colonists who fled the liberated colonies is probably higher than the number of people who fled Vietnam after 1975, proportion. Uh, it was maybe 4% of them, estimated at roughly 4% of the population. And they were fleeing in terror. I mean, they were boat people, you know, fleeing from Boston in the middle of the winter, to going off to Nova Scotia and dying in the snow to get away from these maniacs who uh, had taken over. Uh, there's a, there is literature on that, but uh, you have to search a little to find it. It's usually not taught in high school history courses. Uh, but, uh, uh, and of course, that doesn't even count other two other segments of the population who were scared out of their wits. Uh, one was the blacks. Uh, the slave population who knew what was in store for them if the colonists won the revolution. It wasn't going to be pretty, and it wasn't. Uh, the other was the indigenous population who mostly supported the British for very good reasons. Uh, they knew what these guys were going to do to them, you know. Uh, and, but not even counting them, just even counting, just looking at, white, at the white colonist population, it was, and the few people who've studied it estimate roughly, I, four percent of the population fleeing, mostly to Canada, sometimes other. A good bit of Canada. So you go to Nova Scotia right now, uh, you'll find towns which have signs on them saying, you know, settled by people who fled from the American Revolution in 1780 or something that like that. Of course, come up because of the uh, Cuban uh, yeah. Act. Uh, That's right, yeah. Canada, That's right, yeah. That's right. They argued that Canada ought to have a right to, for anything that was nationalized from Canadian citizens to be restored to Canada and be a good part of the United States, Eastern United States. We hadn't conquered the rest yet. I want to ask a question about um, the role of the United States in world affairs. In your opinion, uh, how much is by design and how much is simply by happenstance. And uh, as an example, what we were just talking, just coming in the door, we have on the one hand this incredible technical apparatus of the United States supporting the Nicaraguan Contras with air supply and computerized information. And then we have at the same time uh, high school age kids wandering around in the jungle shooting off their guns every once in a while. And so I'm wondering, is the United States in fact to be seen as the, the omnipotent hand guiding world affairs, or is it just an instigator and then things take off the way that they do? You could ask the same question about a really well, let I me mean, take the, the, the best run totalitarian state of modern history, Germany. Very efficient state, you know, really modern, super modern, very totalitarian. Uh, how much was planned or how much just happened? Well, it's kind of a mixture, you know. Uh, if you take a corporation, which is a, 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 a successful corporation, say General Electric, is a totalitarian institution, about as totalitarian as any that humans have ever devised, uh, with very tight managerial control, and you know anybody in it is subordinated to the guy above and kicks the guy down below in the face, and so on and so forth. Uh, but it, you could ask the same question. An awful lot that happens is just and people walk, working around the edges, and, you know, not doing just they were told, and doing it some other way, and so on and so forth. I, I don't really think there's any answers to these questions. Uh, from the best-run totalitarian institutions, like, say, GE and Nazi Germany, down to much more flexible, complex structures, uh, there's a mixture. Uh, so, like, for example, the guys who were training, in fact, the, the United States was not able to train the Contra Forces directly because there's too much public opposition here. So it was done indirectly. 
the U.S. had a, a very complex international terror network. Remember, this is this is a big country, big powerful country. It's not kind of like Libya. If Libya wants to carry out terrorism, they hire a couple of, you know, Carlos or somebody. When the United States wants to carry out international terrorism, it hires terrorist states, you know, big guys. So uh, the uh, running, organizing the mercenary forces around uh, Nicaragua was uh, first put in the hands of Argentine neo-Nazis. And then when they sort of lost power, uh, it was Taiwanese and Israelis and British and so on and so forth. I mean, the same guys who trained the uh, narco-traffickers in uh, Colombia and so on. Uh, so this is kind of like an international, it was funded by Saudi Arabia, and there's a huge international terror network of a kind beyond anything the world has ever seen, and that meant there was no really direct control. Like whoever was sitting in Washington, William Casey or somebody, was not determining what Argentine neo-Nazis and Israeli torturers and Taiwanese murderers and so on are teaching these guys to do. Uh, nor was it training, certainly not, you know, telling the British uh, Secret Services how they're supposed to run their part of the show, uh, and so on. So it's a complicated network that, that, for example, the guys that you were interviewing, who knows how they got into it. I mean, you know, it could have been some long, complex story. It could, be, could have been local rivalries. You know, maybe two people in town who hated each other, so they went different ways. Let's see. That can happen, too. So as a follow-up question to that, if you have this, on the one hand, totalitarian control or, or corporate superstructure, and on the other hand, these, these things going on around the edges, what lessons does that have for us on the left who are trying to make change? What can we learn from that and use in order to better make change? Well, I mean, it depends. I, 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 you know, the question of how you change things has no answer either. Uh, because it depends on the circumstances and your goals and you know what tactic is this, is right to achieve this particular goal and so on there just aren't any formulas i mean if you're trying to if if you're dealing let's say with an autocracy and you want to make it less brutal and more benevolent okay then one kind of set of tactics is appropriate you, like you plead say or you plead with the king you know not to kill too many people because it isn't good for him or something uh, on the other hand, if you're trying to get rid of the autocracy, then very different uh, uh, options are available. So if you're interested, if you're worried about, say, corporate, let's take here, okay, people are worried about corporations investing in Burma, okay, that makes sense. In fact, I think there's a meeting within the next couple of days. Uh, so that's pleading with the autocracy to be a little more benevolent, not to be quite so brutal. It's like pleading with the king not to kill so many people. Uh, but it's still going to be an autocracy, you know, and uh, they'll just be, the, it, it may, maybe won't be the most brutal thing you can think of, so it'll do some other brutal thing, uh, or it'll hire somebody to do this brutal thing or whatever, which maybe is a, I'm not saying it's a bad thing to do, like it's nice, it's good to plead with autocrats to be more benevolent. Uh, on the other hand, if you're trying to eliminate the structure of authority and power, you will pursue possibly different paths. And uh, I, I don't think that uh, it's not, you know, it's never obvious what's the right course or what's the right tactic. Those are hard decisions. I mean, like, should you be involved in civil disobedience? Well, there's no answer to that. I mean, in my own personal history, I've done both things. I don't know if it was the right decision in every case. It probably wasn't. But you kind of have to judge what the circumstances are and what you're going to achieve and so on. Very often, I should say close friends of mine, very close friends of mine, I sharply disagree with their tactics. So it takes a civil disobedience. I mean, uh, people like plowshares, say, you know, who sort of, you know, bang missiles on, yeah. I mean, they're people I admire a lot and they're good friends and so on. I think they're dead wrong. You know, I think that they are harming their own cause. Uh, but that's a matter of assessing consequences of actions which is not so simple. There's no formula for it. I might have argued with them about it, like it's not a secret. I have another follow-up to Noam's first question. Was, uh, I'm just preoccupied with uh, what the, if the appropriate authorities were ever asked why, you know, the cocaine coup that put in cronies with Klaus Barbie in Bolivia, if they were ever queried, what do you think they would say? I and mean, of course, they won't be asked, I suppose. But well, what was Klaus Barbie doing in Bolivia? 
working for... How do you get there? Uh, well, I'll tell you. Okay. I mean, we know the story on that case because it sort of came out during the trial. Uh, and in fact, the American authorities who were responsible spoke about it. Uh, Klaus Barbie is the, you know, the butcher of Lyon, one big Nazi killer, uh, was one of the many Nazi war criminals, by no means the major one. He was one of the minor Nazi war criminals who was picked up by the United States as it took over, the United States and Britain, as they w did what we call liberating Europe. Their first task was to destroy the anti-fascist resistance and to restore the traditional order, con traditional conservative order, uh, which meant fascist collaborators and Nazis and so on, which is in fact what happened. Uh, and it happened all over the world. This is sort of chapter one of post-World War II history. If there were such a thing as a history course, if you can sort of imagine that, it's pretty hard to imagine. But if there were such a thing, and it studied post-war history, first couple of, you know, first month or two would be on the first chapter, which is this. Uh, it was done, you know, had to be done differently in different countries. Like in Greece, it required a big counterinsurgency war in which maybe 150,000 people were killed, you know, all sorts of horrible things. Uh, in France, it was done a little differently. Uh, in France, one of the ways it was, because, you know, in France, one of the ways it was done was, uh, a main task was to break up the labor movement. Uh, in some way, that's where the heroin, that's where the post-war drug racket begins. Uh, in order to break up the the fascists ran, I'll get to Barbie in a second, but the fascists ran a kind of tight ship. They really were totalitarian. So they didn't have any use for the mafia. They got rid of them. Uh, they didn't want competitors. Uh, so the fascists pretty well cleaned up the mafia and the drug racket and everything. It's, you know, they don't like that kind of stuff. Uh, so, uh, when the American forces came in, they reconstructed the mafia. Uh, first in southern, in Sicily, where the first you know, invasion was, and they just needed guys to run the place, and they were the obvious ones. Uh, but the uh, main, the one that turned out most important in many respects was the Corsican Mafia, uh, which had been eliminated by the Italian fascists. But uh, as the United States had to break up the French labor movement and the resistance, uh, they needed, you, you have to do things like break strikes, for example and beat up workers and so on. Well, you know, who do you get to do that sort of thing? Well, local thugs, you know, where do you get the local thugs? Well, you know, they've got a network, the old mafia. Uh, of course, they don't do it for nothing, like you have to pay them off. And the payoff was allowing them to reestablish the uh, drug racket, the heroin racket, and that's the famous French connection. Uh, France was sort of the center of the po early post-war international drug trade, which was just a sideshow of the CIA and other efforts to break up the resistance movement and so on in, uh, in France, and then it sort of goes on around the world. But uh, where does Barbie come into this? Well, one of the, uh, Barbie had a role in France and Germany, you know, as a German operating in France. He was uh, operating against the resistance. I mean, his job was to go after resistance guys and capture them and kill them. Uh, well, the United States had the same task when it took over. It had to go after the same people. This is somebody's tape recorder just went off. Uh, the United States had to go after the same people and had to, you know, get rid of them and kill them, the same anti-fascist resistance people. And it just made sense to turn to the experts. Actually, I'm quoting now. I'm after the Barbie, I'm quoting from Barbie's superior, uh, an American, uh, I think he was a colonel, uh, anyway, high American officer in intelligence, who's the guy who ran Barbie under the American intelligence. Uh, after Barbie was picked up and brought to trial, uh, this guy, whose name I think was Kolb, K-O-L-B, if I'm not mistaken, I, I've written about it, I can find it out. Uh, he uh, wrote a letter to the New York Times in which he said, I don't understand what this fuss is about Barbie. Uh, I mean, Barbie was going after the French resistance working for the Nazis, and we were going after the same guys, French resistance, and obviously we turned to the people who knew how to do it, so we turned to Barbie, you know, and we recruited him, and uh, uh, he was doing the same job for us. You know, okay, it was pretty logical, you know. Uh, and he was, that was small potatoes. There were much bigger ones than that. You know, he was, he was not a major criminal. He wasn't like Reinhard Galen, who we put in charge of uh, uh, West German intelligence who was one of the leading war criminals. He was the guy who ran the Nazi operations in Eastern Europe, and you know what that means. I mean, that was the worst horror. So he was put in charge of uh, German intelligence and in charge of counterinsurgency, you know, of operations in Eastern Europe and so on and so forth. 
and that was a big Gehlen network was the major Central European intelligence network, and there were plenty of others. Well, there got to be a point in France when it was pretty hard to keep Barbie going, so they got him out. There was a thing called the Rat Line, uh, which operated with the help of the Vatican and a lot of fascist priests in Croatia and uh, you know, American intelligence and so on. There, there's pretty solid scholarship on this if you're interested. And they got a lot of these guys out. And one of the places they sent them to was South America. So plenty of them are around. Like you go to Brazil, you find Nazi groups, you know, still singing the horse vessel song and all that kind of thing. Uh, Barbie happened to go to Bolivia. Uh, when he got to Bolivia, he sort of picked up the old trade, you know, and he ended up with the cocaine racket, and that's how he got involved in the coup. Well, did they know that he was involved in the military coup in 1980? Uh, who knows? I mean, that, that much detail we don't know. Uh, and probably nobody was paying that much attention to Bolivia at the, at, at the time. Bolivia was a big issue around 1950, but that's because there was big working class movement and miners and you know, uh, left-wing government. And in fact, around 1950, uh, CIA recognized Bolivia and Guatemala as the two major problems in Latin America. So it was a big issue then, but by the 60s it had kind of been settled, you know, put in order. And we, we don't have documents yet from the 1980s, but my guess is that nobody was paying much attention when the, coup, when the Barbie coup took place. So in a way, this is the kind of thing that sort of happens, you know, kind of like happens as a not unpredictable consequence of other actions that are taken where nobody cares much one way or the other. On the other hand, the Barbie story is very revealing if you check it out because of its relationships to much bigger things that were going on, like what I mentioned. And I remember that um, Alex Coburn did a little Village Voice piece a while back where he wondered if prohibition was 100% bad. He mentioned that there were some public health uh, benefits. Um, I was wondering if you think that's, that's irrelevant or, or, or... Well, prohibition cut down the use of alcohol. And right. alcohol is very destructive. I mean, it's much worse than drugs. Yeah. What do you think about the legalization of drugs? Is it? Yeah. I, I don't know. It's, it's not an. Ob I mean, I think it's. I, mean, I don't think there's an obvious answer. Criminalization of behavior is a very dubious kind of project, in my opinion. Uh, and if you look at the history of criminalization of behavior, which is what prohibition is, uh, it's. Uh, I think invariably class linked. It's invari Like I said last night, it's. It's every case I know of. It's linked to control of classes of people you don't like them, not us. Uh, marijuana is an extremely dramatic case of that if you look at the ups and downs of it. In the case of alcohol or say tobacco, um, tobacco is I mean, pr well, uh, probably the most lethal substance is sugar. Uh, that causes more deaths than maybe all the others put together. So okay, it could give an argument for criminalization of sugar, let's say. And that means all the sugar substitutes, too, because they really are very harmful. A lot, a lot of people die from them. Uh, on the other hand, I don't think it's a good idea. You know, uh, What about the criminalization of other substances? Well, um, in my f I, I, I think that these are things you have to be cautious about and experiment with. Uh, so for example, takes, in the case of marijuana, I think there's a reasonably good case for de decriminalization. Uh, one reason is it has no, it, it, among the, like, none of these things are good for you. I'm sure this stuff, whatever it is, is not good for you. Uh, in fact, an uh, old friend of mine who died recently, who was a Nobel Prize winning biologist who was the head of the cancer center at MIT, uh, one of his favorite lines is, was that when people kept finding things that were carcinogenic, he'd say, yeah, that's because they looked at it. Uh, and in fact, it's life that's carcinogenic, you know, and uh, you know, tomatoes are going to turn out to be carcinogenic and so on. Uh, so, you know, anything is nothing. Things have varying degrees of, they have varying effects. And, uh, but of the, vary, of the things with varying effects, marijuana is not at the high end of harm. In fact, I don't think there has ever been an overdose recorded with the uh, Last time I saw figures, about five or ten years ago, it was like 60 million users and no overdoses. Uh, that's not too bad a record. Uh, it's probably, it's certainly not good for you, you know, beyond some limited use. Uh, but the same is true of everything. 
It's true of coffee, it's true of uh, tobacco, you know, it's true of meat, it's true of uh, vegetables if you eat too much of them, I mean, anything. So uh, probably in the case of marijuana, there's a fairly good argument for decriminalization. Uh, with regard to other drugs, and my own, my own view is that the right approach is probably the one that the British took uh, back around 1800 when drinking was becoming a big thing. The, the tax system was modified in such a way that things like beer were much cheaper than things like, say, whiskey. Okay, that's a reasonable incentive system because it moves people over to drinking things that are less likely to be harmful in big quantities than more likely to be harmful in big quantities. And I think things like that are possible. But overwhelmingly, the right answer is education. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's just obvious. I mean, the reason why use of, say, toba tobacco is a very striking case in the United States. I, I don't know. I suspect that not many of your friends smoke. It's extremely rare these days to find. I haven't seen a student at MIT come into my office wanting to smoke for 20 years. You know? It's just not done among wealthy, educated people anymore. It's still true among older people who didn't shake the habit, and it's very common among young people who are poor. So you go to a working class section of town and go to the local fast food place, and every kid has two cigarettes in their hands. Okay. On the other hand, you go to the upscale restaurants, and it's not very likely. Uh, it's just, it became very sharply class-based just on the basis of education. Uh, and the same has been true of other things, like take, say, red meat. There's no criminalization of red meat, but, util but uh, consumption has gone way down uh, simply because of uh, education, you know, people learning about the effects of it. Uh, and I think that's true of everything. I mean, if people are, it, it, well, take say, take, say, the lottery. I don't know if Wisconsin has a state lottery, but a lot of states do. Uh, the lottery is a highly regressive tax. Uh, you, it's, I, I don't know the I've never I don't know the figures here, but I'm sure they're the same as everywhere. In Massachusetts, it's been pretty well studied. Uh, it's a very highly regressive tax. You take the towns in Massachusetts and you ask how much money people spend in the state lottery. It's predictable by level of education and income. The lower the education and income, the more they spend on the lottery. I mean, like in the town where I live, nobody would waste a cent on the lottery. I mean, it's just a, I mean, it's it's like giving your money away, you know. That's what the state lottery is. Uh, poor and uneducated people do it. You go to a town where the average per capita income is maybe ten thousand uh, dollars. They may be spending a couple of thousand dollars per family on the lottery. So what it amounts to is a highly regressive tax. That's why it's pushed so hard. Like there's a ton of advertising for it. I don't know here, but in Massachusetts, it's very heavily advertised and all kind of wonderful gifts about you're going to get five million dollars and this and that and the other thing, yeah, yeah. Uh, and the reason is because it's a terrific way to soak the poor, you know. Uh, you want to, now should you illegal, make it illegal? Well, I mean, I don't think it should be legal to advertise it, frankly, any more than I think you should allow uh, ads for cocaine up in the, you know, on, on television. But I don't think you should criminalize it either. What I think you ought to do is exactly what's done in every sector of educated people, make, get people immediately to understand that you're throwing your money in, you know, if you want to throw your money away, throw it in the ocean, you know. Uh, uh, and when people understand that, there's not going to be any lottery any more than there is in the town where I live. They couldn't sell a lottery ticket there if they tried, you know. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I think the same is true of every, uh, of every form of uh, way of harming yourself, whether it's driving fast or, uh, you know, like wearing a seat belt or, uh, uh, you know, I don't know, what's that stuff where you jump off a mountain holding a rope? Yeah, okay, <laughs> that kind of stuff or, you know, anything. I mean, if there are people who want to experience danger, okay, they ought to be allowed to do it. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it should be a rational decision, something that people are in a position to make a reasonable decision about, and that requires understanding and education and recognition of the consequences and so on and so forth. I mean, that's the answer to drugs. I think the answer at the point, it's overwhelmingly true.
It is also true, as Alex Coburn pointed out in that column, that alcohol use did decline during Prohibition. But, uh, uh, you know, that's, uh, you, could, uh, you could get uh, consumption of uh, milk to decline by criminalizing. Not a good idea. Oh. That's just la last. Quick question. Any, any reaction or surprises with the uh, coverage of the Sacramento Bee article of making the CIA cocaine and other sick? Oh, the Mercury, Mercury News. Mercury News, yeah. Uh, actually, yeah, I think uh, there was actually a pretty good story on that, to my surprise, in the, I guess, Columbia Journalism Review by uh, Peter Kornblum. It, uh, you know, the, I mean, the guy really exposed something. I mean, you know, there were parts of the story that didn't hold up, and there were places where he exaggerated and so on. But yes, the basic point was correct. And furthermore, it wasn't all that new. Uh, like a lot of these things have been exposed by Robert Parry and Brian Barger back around 1985. Actually, I wrote about them in 1985 using their stuff, you know, so like it's not like it's a big news story. Uh, I mean, the de a lot of the details were new. But the basic picture was very old. It had been suppressed by the press all the time. Uh, when it broke in the uh, Mercury News, actually it broke through the Internet. Uh, they have a uh, some kind of an Internet outlet and people picked it up, you know, nobody reads the San Jose newspaper, but it was picked up through the internet and it became a thing. Uh, and the pre big press backed off, didn't like it, you know. And they waited a couple of months and they finally went after the story, but they went after the Mercury News. And they went after the fact that like one of his footnotes was wrong or, you know, he didn't have enough, uh, you know, witnesses for this or I don't know, you know. Uh, or they attacked it on things it didn't say kind of like in this Ebonics business. You attack it for things that people didn't say at all. You know, so There's a big assault on it, and the point was to try to suppress the main story, which was pretty much suppressed. And the big story is essentially the one that Bob Parry uh, picked up around 1985, and he was a well-known reporter at the time. I think he was working for Newsweek or AP or somebody, and they kind of threw him out. They didn't want that story. Uh, so, uh, and they still don't want the story. In fact, that story is the end piece, uh, or a recent piece, of the one I was telling about the heroin connection in France. The trail of drugs follows the CIA very closely. Uh, and it's not because the CIA likes drugs. It's because, it's for very good reasons, it, the same reasons as in France. If you're involved in illegal, clandestine operations. You have to have a lot of money and it has to be untraceable. And you have to have thugs and you got to get them from somewhere. All right, you put together the need for untraceable money with thugs and add it up and it equals the drug racket. So if you take the trail of clandestine activities, you follow it, you get a trail of drugs following it. It goes from France to the Golden Triangle and the operations in that region began, uh, Afghanistan, uh, you know, uh, uh, Contras. Uh, it's just a pretty close trail for pretty obvious reasons. Other intelligence agencies, it's the same. Is there a 